Um, welcome to this uh, roundtable on the future of humanitarian principles, nothing less. Um, in this new book, um, Solferino 21, uh, Hugo Slim ends his um, epilogue with the following. Uh, in the next 10 years, a new generation of humanitarians all over the world will design and lead important humanitarian changes and have other changes thrust upon them. Their progress will not be perfect, but I know they will be courageous and imaginative and that they will help millions of people to stay alive. Now, that takes us into the future. And, uh, in this uh, book, you address uh, principles of humanitarian action from many different perspectives and with a view to several different aspects, including uh, relating to new technologies, to climate change, the localization agenda, amongst many, many other developments. Uh, and in this roundtable, We've picked out some of these uh, themes and topics as they relate to some of the fundamental humanitarian principles as they're currently defined. Um, the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality and independence and asked whether the principle of humanity will survive the future developments where you have a fundamental critique of anthropocentrism and you also have a call for post-humanism where non-human life forms are to be taken in, into account in what was a form of humanist reasoning. Um, second, should neutrality be maintained in the geopolitical environment where you, for instance, have strong authoritarian forces up against democratic forces? You may, we, we see great power struggles and the question is whether this neutrality can then be uh, kept or should be kept as a hallmark for all forms of humanitarian action. And then uh, the, in response to this localization agenda, there's a question of whether self-determination should be introduced as a principle. This is proposed by you in your uh, new book, uh, Slim, uh, as a principle that will actually be quite fundamental for the organization of humanitarian action in the future. And that brings up uh, also uh, potential uh, critical questions as to the consequences of introducing such a principle. So in this round table, Dr. Hugo Slim will share some reflections on this topic against the background of his new book. And we will then open for a conversation among the participants. The other participants have not prepared some intervention. So this will be an open-ended conversation where you will just uh, ask for the word and I will try to chair the discussion. That includes uh, our distinguished online participants uh, and um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you very briefly, just that you are uh, now uh, with the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, University of Oxford, but also you're associated with the Oxford In Institute for Ethics, no, Law, Ethics and Law of Armed Conflict. Um, and you have a rich background from both policy practice and academia um, and um, in, that includes your recent post uh, as policy director at the ICRC. Um, so uh, I said my name is Christoph Lidén, I'm a senior researcher here at PRIO and I suggest that we'll just have a quick round where we just say our names and affiliation limited to that and then we'll get to your introduction. So uh, let's start here. Okay, 
My name is Hedrick Sisa. I'm a research professor here at uh, Prio, working on questions of the ethics and laws of war. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ivar Stokler, and I head the uh, Unit for Humanitarian Values and International Law at the Norwegian Red Cross. Hello, I'm Katrina Holden. I'm heading the Humanitarian Needs and Analysis Unit. Um, hi, I'm Aisha Kral. I am a research assistant at PRIO. Greg Reichberg, research professor at PRIO. And Maria Gabrielson Jumbert, a senior researcher and research director at PRIO and co director of the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. Stein Sundstol Eriksen, research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and co director mm -hmm. of the Norwegian Center of Humanitarian Studies. Excellent. And then we have. Uh, three, uh, four online participants. So, uh, Ralph Seedolf, please. There he is. <laughs> Good morning. I'm not sure if you can hear and see me. We can uh, both. Ralph from Center for Humanitarian Action. Great to have you. Many thanks for the discussion. And Sonia, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Sonia Hüvelmann. I'm also with the Center for Humanitarian Action, um, as is Rolf. I'm very pleased to hear from you. Thank you. And Mukesh Kapila, please. Oh, hi, Mukesh Kapila. I'm a friend of Hugo's and uh, affiliated with him. Thank you. And uh, the two of us have a, a small initiative within the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies where oh, yeah. we wanted yeah. to uh, Yes, uh, I, I was not expecting you to introduce this, but just uh, to because it's part of the background for this uh, seminar, as is also uh, the fact that in the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies, we have a series of so-called scenario webinars where this is one of those also. And yeah, uh, and Emily Hume is a coordinator uh, of the Norwegian Center for Humanitarian Studies. So thanks a lot for being with us. Hi everyone. Okay, so then we're ready to uh, to the thinking. Please. Good. Well, thank you very much, Christopher. Thank you for inviting me to Prio. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here and to be with you all, and it's a great pleasure to be signed by Norwegian Red Cross too. And I have to thank you for being one of the funders and financiers of this book project. So thank you. And it's lovely to be able to thank you in Oslo in person as well. It's great to be in Oslo too on, you know, the day after two auspicious days. So yesterday at the same time, we had Norway's Liberation Day um, and Henri Dunant's birthday, which is Red Cross Red Crescent Day. So in a sense, we are sitting here in the, in the wake of um, celebrations of freedom and humanity, which um, we hope will always prevail, I suppose, in, in our world. So Christopher's asked me to talk, um, and I, I'm very grateful to you for doing this, to ask me to talk about three things that I think are flagged in this book, but not elaborated in the book. And so in a sense, they're things that I started thinking about while I was writing, but was not clever enough or um, able enough to work them through in the book. So it's it's sort of the unfinished, there's a lot of unfinished business in any book, but three areas that are unfinished in, in this book as far as I'm concerned. And in a sense, as Christopher says, they, they orbit around questions of principle and the, the humanitarian principles. I'm gonna take them in a slightly different order to how Christopher introduced them. So I'm going to talk about neutrality in humanitarian aid first, and then I'm going to talk about post-humanism and humanity as a core value and if we need to change it and nuance it and expand it somehow and then thirdly i'll talk about localization and particularly i want to raise the dark side of localization if you like the shadow side because i was very aware to be writing sort of polemically in this book really pushing the ideal case for localization because i think it's important and we need a proper discussion because I think much of the discussion remains secret in, in a way about localization at the moment. So those three things, um, and I'm really glad to discuss them with you as a as a as such a well-informed and expert group here in Oslo. And maybe it will help us all to shape sort of research agendas around, around these areas if they merit 
research agendas. So first of all, neutrality, which of course, as we all know, is the third fundamental principle of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Um, that movement, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement and ideal is politically agnostic, and it has been from Dunant's original vision. And I think that's important to recognize that neutrality is, is not simply a technique for getting access. I believe there is a commitment to political agnosticism as well in the Red Cross, Red Crescent tradition. Um, and as I argue in the book, I think it's it also comes as a very Swiss model of politics, and I call it the Swiss model of humanitarianism, um, that commitment, that political commitment to neutrality. But what's interesting over the last, well, over my lifetime, um, is that that model, the Swiss model, is now the dominant species of humanitarianism. And it wasn't the case when I started out in the very, you know, in the early 80s. And now, also, the United Nations has made principled and politi com political commitments. The United Nations, humanitarianism, and the member states, in a way, by endorsing the, the key um, General Assembly resolutions and repeated resolutions, continues to commit to neutral humanitarianism. And NGOs, surprisingly, too, largely espouse it, and certainly your own Norwegian Refugee Council, um, and many others of the leading international agencies commit to neutrality. So in a way, you could argue that this is quite effective Swiss colonialism, that in a funny way, that it's the one area they have managed to colonize in international relations is this huge field of international neutral collective action in the model of Swiss politics. So I argue and I begin to argue, and I felt it for some time, and I continue to argue in Solfino 21, that we must accept that humanitarian aid and action can be, there can be a pluralism of that around the fundamental principles of humanity and impartiality. And of course, those are the only two truly also, but I'm surrounded by lawyers, referenced specifically in IHL. I mean, there's commitments to not give unfair advantage, but of course, there's no commitment to be neutral in the laws of war. That would be rather absurd by definition. And, you know, warring parties are expected to enable and provide humanitarian aid. So there are, there's a, there's a huge acceptance of non-neutral humanitarian aid. So I put that out there and I, I argue in the book, and I, I want to continue to argue that there's always been two traditions, at least, of humanitarian aid in the, in the Western tradition. And there's a long, legitimate, morally valuable tradition of politically committed humanitarianism, what I call resistance humanitarianism, or humanitarian resistance, or liberation humanitarianism. And if we go back in the, in the in the 20th century, you know, to, to famous organizations that are now committed to neutrality. We could look at the International Rescue Committee, for example, um, which has swung full circle to the full spectrum to the Swiss model now. But that was an organization deliberately set up, subversive, covert, politically positioned to rescue people threatened by Nazism. And so there was no, no way that, in a sense, that was neutral, trying to work with government consent, trying to do all the things required in formal humanitarian aid in IHL. And that tradition was also, we've seen it in the anti-apartheid movements where anti-apartheid humanitarianism was very solidarity based, working with suffering um, in the front lines, front line states and from the front line states. And we saw it against Latin American dictatorship in many parts of Latin America in the 70s and 80s, where again, you had a politically committed form of human rights, humanitarianism, where people were organizing collective action to meet the food, health, um, protection needs of various communities. And of course, you know, for, for somewhere like Norway, when I was growing up, Norway was famous, you know, through Norwegian People's Aid for being very politically committed around South Sudanese independence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, in my mind, non-neutral humanitarian aid, etc. And we saw it in Eritrea as well. And today, of course, we see it in Myanmar, where people are saying, 
don't do formal neutral aid, we are boycotting this government. We are making political commitments to humanitarian resistance in health, education, um, and structuring our own resistance humanitarianism, if you like. And Ukraine, of course, now you know, makes an even bigger example of that form of politically committed humanitarian aid. So I think, and I, I look, you know, reading, I read a fabulous book the other day for you lawyers, which is uh, Dick Van Boyd's History of the Making of the Geneva Conventions, which I was reviewing. And he has a whole chapter on the whole discussion around partisan illegal warriors, um, irregular forces. And in a way, it's a parallel discussion, morally and legally, to what we might call irregular humanitarians, partisan humanitarians, etc. And, you know, the case that they should be recognized, encouraged in many ways, um, and not um, dismissed as not humanitarian and somehow illegal. So that's the, the claim I, I want to make, and I want to work that out more clearly in my own mind in the next um, year or so. And I think this resistance humanitarianism is important for three reasons. First of all, it's ethically important because it works in a politically committed way for political justice. Secondly, I think it's practically extremely important because neutral humanitarianism regularly fails. And I have no doubt in my mind that more evacuations from cities like Mariupol and all over Ukraine have been led, guided, facilitated, structured by resistance groups, resistance rescuers, thousands more people than these very high-profile, neutrally organized, formalistic government consent, hundreds, dozens, not yet a thousand, high-profile rescues. So I think when neutral humanitarianism fails, which it does in terms of geography or category very often, we must say that it's a good thing if resistance humanitarianism is succeeding and saving people. And then finally, I'm, I, I have this sort of ethical hunch that there is value in secrecy. Everyone's obsessed with transparency, but around certain forms of moral good, and certain forms of ethical, courageous activity, secrecy, non-transparency, becomes morally and politically important. So I want to say that just because it's secret and illegal and in the shadows does not make it bad. And I want formal lawyers to recognize that. Hmm. So we recognize it in other things. And we like things like rich, you know, resistance literature, resistance art, resistance music. You were all giving a prize in Oslo, I saw somewhere the other day, for creative resistance where people are painting their trainers, you know, objecting to the Beijing Olympics or whatever. We acknowledge that. Why don't we acknowledge humanitarian resistance? So the question I suppose I, I leave with you um, for us to discuss is how should we theorize and moralize resistance humanitarianism or humanitarian resistance. And of course, we have to take that to its natural conclusion because it means that we don't just mean Western humanitarian resistance. Are we therefore prepared to say we would accept, recognize, acknowledge the value of jihadist humanitarian resistance and pro-Russian humanitarian resistance if groups were acting in humanity, impartially, so supporting their enemies too when they come across them, to rescue Russian soldiers from the front, to support Russian families trying to find out what happened to their, their wounded soldiers, their dead soldiers, would we also accept other politics resistance, if you like? So that's my first question that I, that I leave for us to chat about. And I hope you'll solve, because then I don't have to. Um, and my second one is about post-humanism and humanity. And I, I'm a real new boy here. So I'm, I'm aware that you're all much more ahead of me, probably, in your thinking around post-humanism. But I understand this general word humanity as referring to, and I follow Bruce Maslisch here, who wrote a wonderful book in 2009 about humanity. Um, it refers to our species human species. So it refers to a kind of animal, if you like. It refers to a kind of moral behavior 
of kindness, compassion, fellow feeling, all those human things we like and Adam Smith things we like in my country. And it also applies to a meta identity that it gives us a way of using the first person plural, the we pronoun about all of us. So it gives us a sort of meta collective identity beyond just being an animal, but actually an animal with certain common traits that we rely on to cooperate with each other. So embedded in Solferino 21 is an awareness that all three of these aspects of humanity, our species, our behavior, and our meta identity may be about to change, but I wasn't able to think it through clearly enough. So at a species level, I think we are about to change. So humanity will mean something different as a description of us as an animal. So we have always existed and thrived and succeeded in our planetary territory by living a sort of hybrid humanity where we team up with our this gift we have to make tools. So we've always been part technical, part biological. And that goes back to putting on clothes, to riding horses to go faster, um, to making computers, to inventing medicines. We exist always in what some theorists call human machine interaction or human technology interaction. We are never simply, I mean, I'm not at the moment because I'm stuffed with vaccine and I'm wearing glasses. So we're not always simply biological humans as it were. Now this is gonna change even more as artificial intelligence and biotechnology and all sorts of biological enhancements and um, are going to change us. And I wonder if we aren't, and everybody wonders, if we're not on the point of a similar sort of homo erectus moment when we first took to our legs as a species and stood upright. And then maybe also that other moment when we became homo sapiens and got a bigger brain and probably became more ruthless. Because as you know, everybody wonders what happened to Homo erectus, because it was the most successful human species of all kind. It lasted for 1.5 million years. And then there's a strange thing that when Homo sapiens arises, Homo erectus disappears. Well, why? So I have a feeling that that moment of becoming bigger brained and more ruthless. So the question for us to think about here is, is our humanity our very nature as a species going to change? And what does that mean for how we understand what it means to care for that new creature, if you like, and for that new creature to be caring when it's so teched up? And so the second aspect that's crucial there is in humanitarian work. As we go forward, I think we face this um, new tension between AI and EI, between artificial intelligence, which is going to exponentially increase, and emotional intelligence, which will adapt to that, increase with that, and how do we keep it caring? So I can see that in humanitarian work, AI is going to really escalate our ability to do logistics, to massively generalize social protection through digital aid and, and all these things to digital bodies that we engage with now and never meet through mobile phones, through tech, through implants increasingly, whatever. So there will be new aid deliveries thanks to AI. The question is the other part of that humanity meaning, which is the moral behavior. How do we retain compassion? How do we program compassion into algorithmic AI humanitarianism? Um, and how do we still deliver huge programs of AI-based aid, but still meet a Ukrainian woman crossing the border into Poland with a cup of tea, a hug, and reciprocal tears if necessary? So that AI v EI tension. And the question there is how can we ensure that machine humanitarianism retains caring humanitarianism? So it's soothing and not just solving problems as well. The second area of the post-human question, of course, is about our place as a species amongst millions of other species. 
And this is, I moved to the country, you know, as a lot of old, old geezers do at my age. And I'm loving it. And I'm surrounded by non-human life and find it deeply refreshing. Um, probably because I'm not living next to malarial mosquitoes and things, which is a rather dodgy form of human life for us. But it does make me think, and a whole climate crisis makes me think, about in terms of post-human humanitarianism, what does climate humanitarianism mean about non-human life? And I've been wondering whether I should write this blog, which just is titled, What's So Good About Human Life? Why do we center human life? Why do we prioritize human life? Why is humanitarianism centered solely on the protection of one species? Pache, Geneva Convention's lawyers, where you try and protect the environment, but largely instrumentally for the species, actually, not as life in itself. So that's the second thing I'm wondering about. And how are we going to answer that question as we go into a world where we have to take account of non-human value much, much more. And I think this is important for humanitarianism because at the moment, as I said, we treat non-human life instrumentally. Its value is because we can live off it and live from it. So we need it, ergo it is good and has moral value. And I think we need to go on beyond that and actually prioritize a, a movement that can be open to the absolute value of non-human life next to the absolute value of human life. So the, the question for us to think about there would be, what does it mean to center all life in 21st century humanitarianism? And the obvious answer to that first is that you get rid of the name humanitarianism and you have a vitarian movement, not a humanitarian movement, and you have a vitarian ethics, not humanitarian ethics. And so you move beyond speciesism and anthropocentrism towards a vitarian movement. And unless I got my Latin wrong, I hope that means a movement in a sense for all life. But then of course we don't want all life because we don't want the COVID um, virus and all that <laughs> stuff. So it'll be just as complicated, but I think that embrace will be increasingly important in the future. So thirdly, and then I'm going to shut up, localization, which I'm very sort of supportive of in, in this book, but I didn't explore its dark side in detail. So I argue in Solfrino 21 for humanitarian self-determination. I argue that the international system built, as I said now, in the Swiss model of, of principled Red Cross humanitarianism is too international. Mm -hmm. And we need now less international agency and an increase in local and national humanitarian agency. But in the book, I argue largely philosophically about this because I'm really trying to push people to talk about it honestly. And I argue philosophically that this is right, that humanitarian self-determination, the ability of us, you as Norwegians, to finance homegrown, autonomous, um, national and local groups, and not in a sense overwhelm them is morally important. So I argue against humanitarian colonialism. I against humanitarian westernism. But I am probably too simple because localization is not all sweetness and light. So we need to take the shadow seriously. And that shadow is probably the risk and the practice of the political co-option of national and local humanitarianism by local tyranny. I mean, we will watch now the Russians in their liberated areas, get rid of Ukrainian language, get rid of the ruble, get rid of the leadership of the Ukrainian Red Cross, you know, co-opt that organization and rush it as localized, national, Russian, Donbass, whatever. We'll watch that happening again. And that happens in national societies and our movement all over the world, which are often family dynasties. I've sat with leaders who are the third generation of their male line to run their national organization. They're embedded in a part of society, etc. So there is no doubt a shadow around 
political ownership and the risk of tyranny in self-determined humanitarian aid. There's also the risk of corruption and the, and the general risk of just ill will and incompetence and negligent and just, and, and just not being good. So humanitarian self-determination is about somehow funding freedom and the freedom to go wrong. And of course, that makes it morally very risky. And it compares a bit to you know, post-independent states and the importance of new sovereignty, independence, but the risk of tyranny and dysfunction. So some national humanitarian institutions and local organizations will be very good and they will succeed because look at you, you have here in the Norwegian Red Cross and other places. Um, some will be ethical failures, just as there's ethical failure in excessive internationalism as well. So my conclusion there is less than I say in the book, humanitarian self-determination is morally risky. So that question is, that's the last one, how do we manage the risk? Is there a place for humanitarian empire and humanitarian sovereignty? Do we need a mix of sort of humanitarian empire, internationalism, and what's the balance? And is in fact, as I think a lot of people subliminally argue, is excessive internationalism a lesser evil than wicked nationalism? So I'll stop there and thank you very much for addressing my unanswered questions from this, this text. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so thanks so much uh, for, for this uh, fantastic introduction. Um, I'll not now open uh, the floor uh, for, for a discussion. And, and this, is, uh, this is really in the spirit of uh, a very open-ended scholarly exchange. So uh, I forgot to mention that we're also organizing this collaboration with the Norwegian uh, Red Cross, and they will also have a book launch uh, later today. Um, but this, this seminar is really for trying out thoughts, uh, ideally also uh, slightly provocatively, and uh, there's nothing sort of policy related in this specific discussion. Uh, you write in your book who it is for, and you mention students, but not actually scholars. <laughs> so I also guess you didn't really write the book for scholars, but having read it, I found it extremely useful also as an overview and update on a lot of different relevant topics on this subject. But uh, with that, I'd like to just open the, the floor and uh, let's see where it takes us. That includes uh, our dear online participants. So just raise your hand uh, if you're online here. Okay, Henrik and uh, Stein. Henrik. Well, my intention to go first, but just um, once again, thank you. Uh, refreshing important and not least built on so much experience and scholarship already so thank you just want to venture a um hint of conservatism not in the political sense but in the methodological sense there is a big debate in uh, generally in the ethics of war and the laws of war about whether we need to change the basic laws not least because of artificial intelligence and all kinds of new new weapons but there are those who say that it's dangerous to change things that have turned out to work quite well and you could make the argument that the humanitarianism that we have now is actually quite sturdy and has been built up over a long period of time. You should be a little bit careful with uh, starting to change that whole scale because of some new things. There are so many new things that can happen. We have, for instance, a debate around um, the principles of uh, the use in Bellow engendered by the scholar Jeff McMahon, whom you may know, that these should change completely because they don't make sense. But a lot of people say, well, they've been built up over a long period of time and they do make quite a lot of sense. So if we are to change them, let's change them piecemeal rather than throwing out the window what we already have. Now, is this a possible argument that could come the other way, especially when it comes to vegetarianism rather than humanitarianism, that we should rather take as our point of departure what we have so painstakingly built up as international law and as principles of international law? Um, uh, or are we at a point now, do you think, that is so radical that is changing things so dramatically 
partly because of AI, partly because of the climate change uh, crisis, that we really also need to react radically. Uh, you don't have to answer that at all, but it's a question I at least have in the back of my mind. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I suggest we take two more um, questions. Otherwise, we can discuss this for the whole seminar. <laughs> so just to get a few more voices uh, into the on, on the table. So please, Stein and then Ralph. Yeah. Um, well, thanks a lot for some very thoughtful and thought-provoking ideas. And I wanted to ask you about perhaps a t possible tension or the related how you see the relationship between some of the th at two or at least two of the three items you brought up, namely that of um, uh, resistance humanitarianism on the one hand and localization on the other. Because it seems to me that the further you push the localization argument, the more difficult it will be to uh, maintain the resistance argument. Because um, if one gives high priority to self-determination, then how can one support resistance? <laughs> the, the, there's a potential tension between those two principles, which are, I, I'm not sure how it can be resolved, but it seems to me that it's certainly there. Mm -hmm. they're, they're clearly interconnected. Mm -hmm. Ralph, please. Um, many thanks, Christopher. Uh, many thanks, Hugo. Um, uh, always inspiring. Uh, really, really great to to listen to to your views, specifically on the principles. I would have one question a bit um, on on how you framed very refreshing and if I got you right uh, on the balance of the principles versus um, the idea of accepting a more diverse humanitarian system. And basically, if I got you right in your book. Um, a setting of a Chinese humanitarian system, a sort of Russian or, or Arabic one, a diverse one, uh, and the end of the dominance of, of the Swiss system, which sounds very, very just and participatory in a way, but if there might be a tension um, on the very interesting points you, you outlined on the principal side. If I got you right on the, on the um, balance of neutrality, um, which often, of course, rather comes with a political stake and uh, discussion coming um, at the same time, if I'm not misled, if more an advocacy approach might be appropriate again for humanitarians as well, and if a political stance is needed. Uh, versus some, sometimes mixing it uh, in the international debate with operational issues of impartiality of humanity, as you as you always uh, also um, uh, indicated, I believe in in your intro, which I found very interesting, and even coming with a myth, if it's correct. But please, uh, if you could elaborate more on that one, with a myth that this logic of the the more neutral humanitarian aid is provided, the better access and reach it will achieve and if I got you right um, um, I, I you had some doubts if that's true and I mean if you look at a uh, crisis like Syria I think there's a lot of evidence uh, one might even provoke uh, be, be provocative in a way the more neutral agencies have been the less access they they had in these political crises so so what how, how do we deal with these challenges but leading this quickly coming to my question is, is is might there be a tension on on this diversity of humanitarian approaches because um if if we look at the way for example chinese assistance is provided globally um isn't it coming uh, in a very unprincipled way in a very interest driven way um, not accepting values in this insistence uh, in, in this assistance um, let alone a value of only being needs based only being impartial and, and um, um, not uh, focusing that much um, on issues like uh, we need a needs-based approach, and that's the top priority, even if we don't discuss issues for, for of political neutrality, which might be refreshing um, as you outlined. Um, I hope that um, uh, you came across uh, what my key point could be, and thanks for answering this very difficult question, I know. <laughs> Thank you. So three. Uh, huge uh, topics of discussion, and uh, please. So, Henrik, yeah. 
I am a great admirer of Edmund Burke, so <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm not suggesting a year zero and a sort of Robespierre reinvention of everything at all. So I am, um, I am, I have huge respect for conservatism's core, um, you know, request and, and wisdom in a sense, which you outlined so well, is that, you know, don't destroy everything if some of it's working quite well. Etc. Um, but I do think there's scope for radicalism, and there is there are radical shifts in in every response and adaptation to new human events, new human uh, context, and everything. So I I'm certainly in favour of of recognising what's good in the system, and I do do that in the book. I make very clear that actually I, I compare Syria 20, 1916 and Syria 2016 and say, look, this is an extraordinary achievement. That, that we've made with this formal system and its development and everything. So I, I, I wouldn't want to, um, I would reform and tweak and yeah. recommend gradualism rather than Robespierre revolution and year zeros and things. Um, but I, on your point about are we, are we at a particular moment where we're facing um, particularly um, extraordinary moments of change. I think probably, I think it's very important we get our relationship right with non-human life and what we all used to call nature. Um, so I think somehow we need to reconcile a concern for human nature and non-human nature um, in all our projects. And you know, one way of looking at the humanitarian movement over the last 30 years is that it's really just, it's, it's the new version of the, of the human rights movement. It's trying to do every right you know, but I think we also need to extend into um, a more environmentally conscious movement as well. And I think we are, we are. And certainly if I look at the wider activities of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, you know, their climate center and lots of other things, they are really focusing on the value of nature to us and the risks from nature and the risks to nature. Now, whether they're being instrumental in their ethics there and saying, because we need nature as a species to survive, or whether there is a broader movement that we love nature in itself, I think that's what humanitarians have to work out in a sense. So it's a more gradual thing. Um, and Stein, your question is really good, of course, about the tension between localization and resistance. And if you really encourage localization, then you will get what you're sort of suggesting is you'll get probably state capture by one form of politics and therefore um, there'll be no room for resistance because in a sense you would have localized everything and it'll be used against people with other values is what I'm hearing from you. Um, so there's that tension. Um, and I, you know, I think there's going to be tension in everything. I'm, I'm, you know, as you know, it's not surprising when attention is pointed out because that's the world we live in. That's life as it is. But I don't think you have to take the pessimistic view. Um, I think that will happen sometimes, that bad localization of bad structures will obliterate resistance. But I think sometimes um, supporting resistance, encouraging resistance will also challenge those structures. So I, I hope the tension will sometimes work well, as it is in Ukraine at the moment, and hopefully Myanmar to some degree. That's 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 why I think you probably can invest in both. And of course, you can invest strategically in localization that supports um, political commitments you have as well, beyond humanitarian ones, possibly. Seeing as one of the problems I think we have today is that humanitarian means everything. You know, it is the human rights project um, swallowed up by this thing called humanitarianism. Now. Um, which, funny enough, it was in the 19th century. You know, if you read the 19th century, when they talk about humanitarianism, they mean everything. And then we restricted it right down, and now it's gone right big again. So it's a bit weird. So I, I don't have any great answers to your question about the tension, but I recognize it, and I think it will be, it'll be being felt all the time. Um, yeah. And Ralph, your, your question about a more diverse system, yeah, you, you know, you put it well, it's, it's, it's complicated and it's similar that you will end up with a system you don't really want. And I argue in the book that we need a system of systems. We need to encourage a bit like COP. I, I say it's got to be a bit like the COP process, that actually you've got to encourage all, all big global systems or what I would call empires, great powers, now that they're back, 
towards humanitarian values that they shape in their own way and decide in their own terms. Because realistically, politically, um, the Western system will not win everywhere. So, you know, Ralph's not likely to take a team to Russia. He's not likely to take a team to China and charge around and infuse them with Western liberal humanitarianism. Um, so, or India, large parts of the world are always going to be closed to the Western humanitarian system that we're talking about growing so well over the last hundred years, um, which means it's a futile project, in my view, to try and globalize the Western humanitarian system. More realistic is to try and create different humanitarian systems that even if they're run by the communist Chinese, Chinese Communist Party, um, or the BJP, who are becoming pretty close to pretty dreadful as well, um, they still share those key ideas of humanity and impartiality, but they might implement them through what we would consider almost fascist youth groups, because some of these Red Cross, Red Crescent movements do look a bit like fascist youth groups sometimes uh, when you see them on the ground. So I think that's what we have to hope. But maybe I'm foolish and maybe the West will win and um, our values will be taken on everywhere. But that doesn't seem to be how it's going for the next 50 years. Um, so I think we have to seek pluralism around some basic goods that we recognize that even political institutions and political structures and systems that we otherwise despise can still organize hospitals, treat the wounded, treat prisoners better, etc., etc. I think. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, so Maria and Greg. And, uh... Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is really interesting and, and, and a lot of thought provoking and, uh, and yes, useful thoughts to, to, to think on all these issues, these attentions that we are used to thinking around. But, but you're, yeah, this is good food for thought to, to, to think further uh, on some of these, uh, these uh, dilemmas. My, my question is a little bit an extension of the, this, this question of the, a diverse humanitarian system or you know, plural system, and, and, and also being um, uh, also, uh, appreciating your, in a way, how you challenge us when you think, when you say that if we are going to think around resistance humanitarianism, it would be to also accept the jihadi resistance humanitarian system or, or a progression one, for instance. And, and I have seen at another, I don't know, at another level or another scale, um, if you want. Um, a few years ago, I, I led this project on Brazil's involvement in humanitarian aid, uh, or in or Brazil's way of doing humanitarianism, uh, which brought me to, to a conference on South-South humanitarianism mm -hmm. in India. And uh, there was something really interesting about that, because for us, we were discussing are these uh, emerging powers, etc., in the in the global south, uh, investing more in humanitarian aid? But those who were representing many of these countries wouldn't necessarily call it humanitarianism. They would call it a, a partnership on equal footing. They would call it uh, aid or the different terms. What what we would refer to as humanitarianism. Mm. And there was a clear sense that humanitarianism was something of the West. That was both from the Chinese mm. diplomat who was there and maybe from India as well. So, so, I, so I was wondering how do we also reflect around the plural humanitarian system if what, the, as you mentioned, the Chinese one don't necessarily call it humanitarian or Chinese humanitarian aid, they maybe call it something else. That may be the same for the jihadi uh, branch or something who are caring for life and building hospital. But they may not call it humanitarianism. Uh, so that that's one uh, side of, of that, that. And the other side of that is is when the, uh, humani the term humanitarian is used for strategic reasons to call something that isn't necessarily humanitarian, but to yeah, to advance other things that, that we also know well of. So 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 when thinking of a more plural humanitarian system, I was wondering how we accommodate for different uses of the term and, and different practices that, that uh, yeah, are, are not necessarily called humanitarian. Excellent. So we'll take Greg and then Katrin. I thought it was really brave of you to focus on the, the, 
the, the issues in your book which remain unresolved, <laughs> you know, half baked, if I can put it that way, that, that's great. Um, the, um, I don't know, this elicited a lot of thoughts in me, and I'm trying to figure out which, which of these thoughts would be of interest to other people, you know. <laughs> The, they're, they're about around AI. I've been working on that quite a bit with Henrik. I don't really have a question there, but it'd be, maybe over lunch we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the Swiss neutrality thing. And the Swiss are now moving away from it, you know, apropos of Ukraine. For the first time, really, they, they voted to um, freeze Russian assets. And apparently in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, I know there are oligarch assets and probably other assets as well, and I understand that that would, that that tailed a long debate in the in the parliament, um, and now there's the very conservative parties trying to overrule that decision, override it. But but anyway, the um, there's a, a Swiss theologian whose writings I like very much, named Charles Journet. And during the Second World War, he wrote a book called Christian Exigencies in, in Politics. And it was made up of homilies. So during the war, he would give these homilies in Geneva. The church would be packed. He'd finish the homily and the church would suddenly be empty again because people were just going from the international community to hear his, his homilies, his sermons, which were very focused on matters of the present day. And he was really condemning deportations, the sorts of things that the Nazis were doing, you know, and then his bishop tried to get him to back off because he said, you're going to endanger our humanitarian initiatives. But anyway, he had this idea that he develops in, in the book called, he, it's, he says, neutrality is not equivalent to moral neutrality. So he kept saying, we cannot be morally, we can't, we, there can be no stance of moral neutrality. So um, anyway, so my question, my thought is, sometimes I wonder whether in the Swiss, the neutrality that, you know, the, the, the idea that was developed, whether it, it's a very Protestant idea, because it basically wants you to, it, it's kind of a rejection of metaphysics. You don't think of primary causes you think of the use in bellow as though it's a, it's a sealed environment. Use ad bellum is something else. It's sort of like God up there. Inherent justice. So you just seal off the use in bellow. And, and then you can get very comfortable with neutrality uh, because you've made this sort of almost ontological decision to... <clears throat> so I don't know, do you think there's anything to my, you know, this, this, uh, this thought of mine? also shows how comprehensive this book actually is and I, uh, for me as well as, as everyone else said I think it's well, uh, very well written and really, really refreshing and it was even more refreshing to hear your introductory remarks now that it, it, it at least from my perspective so thank you for that too um, I, I had um, two comments and one, one question uh, one comment is regarding the localization agenda and 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 in, in, in many ways, you know, we completely agree. And I, I think that's a very important part of, for example, the Norcross international strategy is to support the national societies and, and always, you know, work with the uh, uh, locally led um, responses. Uh, but at the same time in your book, you argue for what you call simple aid and criticizes the, what you call the Baroque humanitarian system, which I, 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 I think, yeah, so refreshing in many ways. And, uh, and arguing for what I see as a Scandinavian version of maybe when it comes to humanitarian aid. And in, in, in many ways I agree, but at the same time, uh, given the uh, localization agenda, is this, uh, isn't there a tension between the two? Because you're broadening up, making it more diverse, and uh, probably will not focus as much as you would like on the simple aid, as you call it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's not only food and, and saving life and health, it's, uh, it's, uh, it will probably broaden up what is actually aid. And I, I'm wondering whether there's a tension between two arguments, you have that there in the book. And, and my second comment is partly related to the simple aid argument again. It's um, you, you make a very distinct uh, division between the physical and mental health and, you know, focusing on um, food and uh, 
different items, you know, uh, and 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 that might be right in the war setting, but now um, we already talked a lot about it, the climate changes, and more and more of the humanitarian response is uh, due to uh, climate-induced disasters. And responding with uh, uh, buckets of rice is probably wrong when what the guys or the people on the ground need is a uh, stronger embankment and, 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 uh, and other ways of uh, coping and, and mitigating those climate crises. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if your argument for a simple aid is it's, um, maybe worthwhile in a war setting, but uh, it's, uh, it should be broadened at least when you, when you talk about uh, conflict crisis. Mm -hmm. And then my uh, uh, last almost it's just a question. It's, it's um, you, I, 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 had, I, I honestly I just didn't understand your argument when it, you were arguing about um, during or, uh, talking about neutrality. You argue, argue for the value of secrecy. And giving my background from the intelligence service, I'm very skeptical to secrecy in general. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a power and it's a misuse of power very often. To you know, it's so I, I just I was wondering. Um, I, I didn't understand the argument. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. What is the others again? Okay, so should we see if the deal is done? So I'll take um, Greg's last. So I'll start with Maria and then Catherine Lingri. <laughs> So, so, Maria, yeah, it's really interesting to hear your experience of South South Aid and, and, and trying to find um, other ways of talking about the same thing. It reminded me of that phrase, you know, that silly thing from Moliere, when a guy realizes he's been speaking prose all his life. Do you know that in, in one of Moliere? But he didn't know it was called prose. OK, so, so that's in a sense what you're saying. And, and I think that's so true of so much of human life is that we do things, but we call them other things or don't know that that's what they are or whatever. I remember when I was in ICRC and we put a lot of time into trying to engage with China. And so I went a couple of times and we would have think tank meetings like this. And, you know, I used to say that, that, that our challenge, because I would use their language, was to find humanitarianism with Chinese characteristics, you know, which is their great phrase for everything, something like with Chinese characteristics. And, and that seemed to be the challenge. And, um, and it didn't seem too hard to do, in a sense, drawing on their um, you know, their ancient wisdom traditions of the Confucian traditions and, and other traditions, and also the party's commitment to various good things, you know, in their endlessly repeated, revoted um, doctrines of the party and 10 year plans and things. There's a lot in there that could be prose without knowing it was prose, if you're Moliere, you know, and could be humanitarianism without calling it humanitarianism. So I really believe in that overlap. And I think. Um, the, the other thing is that, you know, if humanity is a genuinely universal moral commitment, which everybody says it is because we argue we're part of a universal movement, then, of course, we must expect it to be everywhere, but not necessarily in our image. And that must be the challenge. And that goes back to Ralph's question. That must be the challenge to recognize things as humanitarianly good, even if they don't use our jargon or whatever. So I, I really do think that's the challenge of the next 10, 20 years um, in some way. Um, so I'll come to Catherine's last. So Catherine, yeah, great comments and criticisms. And it's, you know what it's like, but when you write a book, you know, I'd probably finish this book really in June, July last year, and then it was proofing and editing, you know, end of August. Of so it's been jolly nearly a year since I read, and you have a lot of new thoughts and you realise, oh God, I didn't work on that and why I didn't understand that's where I should have taken that and that sort of thing. So it's great that, you know, we're, we're doing that. So simple aid. Yes, that was a classically sort of undeveloped in the book, really. Um, but I don't think it just means basic needs and basic aids. What I, what I was really trying to get at, and I probably should have done it better, was probably simpler institutions. Because what I was really objecting to was the bureaucratic, the bureaucratization of humanitarian aid in these huge self-interested institutions now, and how they make everything so complicated. Um, and I do believe that it, it can be simpler in the way it's framed and delivered, actually. But I totally take your point that, you know, if you're going to do climate aid, it's going to be complicated because you're going to have to do many things to mitigate, adapt, whatever. Um, but I think the other thing I'm trying to say in the book is that people will drive a lot of that 
and local government and institutions nationally, the humanitarian's job is somehow to enable and support that in the simplest way possible, um, rather than binding them into even more overcomplicated systems of objectives and reporting. And I think it comes after that bit where I say, you know, apparently there are 46 objectives in, a, in, in humanitarianism today. Well, you know, is that, is that really what we should be about? But maybe it is as complicated as getting spaceships to the moon, and there are 2,000 objectives or whatever. I think. But I think it's more about simple institutions supporting people's agency rather than complicated institutions complicating the way money is given, objectives are set, and people have to adapt to meet the organization. I think. But it was obviously it's not quite clear. And then the value of secrecy. So I haven't really thought about this yet, but and I, I understand exactly where you're coming from on this and how it can be so dangerous and pernicious and uh, degrading of a system. But what I'm really trying to say is that there is value in human lives which are saved secretly and covertly below the radar, below politics. Um, and and that must be important. You know, I think it'll be totally wrong is that if the history is written of these evacuations from these Ukrainian cities and people only talk about the hundreds that have been saved publicly, transparently, with consent of the warring parties through the OCHA HCR, uh, ICRC system. Because actually that's missing all sorts of good things that happened in secret. So I'm saying that I don't know, I'm not saying that secrecy is necessarily good in itself, but good things can happen in secret and that shouldn't be stopped because it's somehow illegal or irregular or beyond state control or beyond the consent of governments. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I was writing as a Christian about this the other day as well. And of course, because because Greg's introduced theologians, I can be my logical self as well. And it's very interesting in the Gospels how much Jesus values secrecy and how much he has to work in secret to bring about good things. Because in a sense, if, you know, he asks people, he heals first, not to tell anyone, keep it secret. Because if it comes out too soon, he'll be busted too soon and his project will be stopped too soon. And then when he's, you know, going off to organize the Last Supper, he also, it's, it's quite obvious, he has to do it in secret. So he has to send one of the disciples, look, you'll find a donkey. Or something. He's stitched it up secretly because if it's known where he is, that will never happen. So in a sense, I do think theologically and philosophically and politically, there is an importance to secrecy and therefore there's an importance to secret humanitarianism. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, but dodgy, shifty security officials who keep their bad deeds secret should rot in hell forever. Hmm. Okay, so um, we had Greg. Probably stereotyping Swiss neutrality a bit. And certainly I'm probably stereotyping ICRC neutrality a bit because, of course, they, they would say they're not morally neutral because they're constantly working with the law to challenge uh, parties legally and morally. So, yeah, to say that they're, say they opposite, operate by neutralism, I wouldn't say they're not constantly just not making any judgments. They're not, they're not going to hell, you know, in Dante terms. <laughs> um, they have a flag and they, they hold it firmly here and now. They don't chase it later in hell because they never had it. Um, so maybe, maybe I'm being unfair. I really agree with your point about sealing off the Yusin Bello, and it's, it drives me mad. And it's one of the hardest things I found about working in the ICRC and trying to be neutral in the ICRC, because basically you pretend there's no link between ad bellum morality and in bello morality. And for me, it's just completely untrue that, um, you know, the nature of what you're fighting for changes the, the moral acceptability of how you fight, in my view. I mean, it really does. And, that's, maybe I'm just a Brit because we're so belligerent that we're like that. But but um, who's the great scholar at Yale, the legal scholar, who, who wrote that book about, you know, Dunant and the other view of war? Barnett. Michael Barnett? No. 
I don't know if you hear somewhere. But I mean, he makes that point that, you know, do not just completely seals off Yusin Bello and he's not prepared to see anything really morally valuable in war. That, you know, people, young people being killed might be, a, you know, might have moral good to it if they're going to secure justice. And I think that's what I always find difficult about the, the neutrality of the, of the Red Cross movement's tradition, that they would they just were, as I said, politically agnostic. They wouldn't, they were sort of morally myopic. Do you know anyone, just from a scholarly point of view, who's tried to dissect what the, the background to this is? Where it came from? Yeah, the, the sort of the history of ideas background. No, but I think, you know, if, if, Sam, if you ask Sam Moyne or someone, or, or this other chap, whose name I'll get in a minute, he's a really nice guy, um, they'd probably say the history is actually, as it so often is, is just practicality, it's just pragmatism, that actually if you do that and say you're doing that, you can operate better. I'm sure that's probably what the ICRC do, because I can't believe people really believe that the way you behave in war <laughs> bears no relations to what you're fighting for. And in a sense, that's still embedded in the principles of proportionality and military necessity anyway in the, in the laws. That's, that's the way that you can make the ad bellum that's the ad bellum in bello link in IHL, so it exists anyway. It says, we're not going to define what it is, but sometimes you can do whatever the hell you like if your cause is, and in more or less. You know, in... So I, I agree that there's some mythic thing going on about sealing off your sin bello. There is this there's a professor, probably retired now, at the, the Institute in Geneva, where's the court? Graduate the... Institute. Right? Graduate Institute? Graduate Institute, named Peter Hagenmacher. Mm. I mean, the one person I know who's gone into a little bit of the background, he's the one who said it's sort of like the, the approach to explaining nature in the 19th century, where you seal off nature. Yeah. It has its own inner workings without any primary causes relevant. Mm. So he said that this thinking is an extension of that. Yeah. But, you know, it, was the, it was the hardest thing for me to live in in the ICRC for five years there because it didn't make moral sense. I see, I, I, I sense a tension here where, uh, where Henrik might disagree. No, no. Uh, <laughs> so, but but uh, and, and we might be able to get back to that. I, I have uh, Eva, I'll, I'll, I'll I, do my... Uh, I think it's a sort of practical deceit or conceit mm. that you use to move around the world as a humanitarian. Mm. You probably say it, but you know it's not really true. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's um, quite tricky to get away from uh, from the, the instrumental distinction between in Bello and at Bello if you really want to do what you if if in Bello is to make sense. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I I have a few uh, a few thoughts. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, I, I, I have myself just quickly um, on this issue of neutrality. So it's it's more of a technical question because I've seen uh, you writing and explaining the different principles uh, and how impartiality is different from neutrality, two different principles. But I wonder how in practice uh, it is possible to get rid of neutrality while retaining impartiality in humanitarian operations. You, you, you quickly mentioned an example where you would treat an enemy combatant uh, impartially when you come across this combatant. But could you give some concrete examples of how this could happen? Um, and then when it comes to self-determination, I was wondering, because um, uh, at, at, at one point you specify that uh, national, uh, that, that national organizations would be uh, the way to go if they adhere to international norms and collaborative, effic collaborate efficiently, uh, efficiently with also international agencies. This sounds like a form of internationalism to me. So self-determination as defined from an internationalist perspective. 
when nationalism is constrained by certain international norms. So there seems to be a qualified form of self-determination that you're actually arguing for. And then I get curious about this qualifier, because is this qualifier then only that it is in accordance with humanity and impartiality? Or is it also that it's in accordance with some sort of a broader set of international norms? And what about human rights? So if it's a very narrow one, you're in the kind of pluralist side of internationalism, where international norms should really not interfere with internal politics. If it's more also qualified by some fundamental human rights, then we're in the more kind of solidarist side of internationalism. Um, and and there, there might be a sort of balance in, in between those two that you're hinting at. And for me, that is a very sensible place to be. So, but I wanted to hear your mm. thoughts on mm. uh, Ivar and then uh, Mukesh. Thank you very much. I, I think it would be interesting to, to elaborate a bit more around the, the use in Bello, and, and I think we could go on for hours uh, talking about how, how the, the benefits also of having the unselected Bello. But I also think, and not being a scholar in this, but I, I think that the pragmatic, um, I mean, I'm arguing this also in a pragmatic way makes, makes a lot of sense because this is what could be done, and this is also how it can be shaped. And I would also like to, to ask you a question, how you see then the ICRC and maybe also the whole Red Cross Red Crescent movement as a quite pragmatic movement in terms of how they're using uh, the principle of neutrality. I mean, we have examples from just recently from, from Afghanistan, where, where Taliban has introduced a president uh, in the Afghan Red Crescent Society, which is, of course, if you look at it, uh, questioning their role as a neutral actor. But at the same time, the ICRC is is working along with them and, and sort of then having quite a pragmatic look at the principle of neutrality. If you look at all Red Cross societies around the world, historically, I mean, in, during the Second World War in Norway, uh, and then the, the German uh, occupiers put in a, a German uh, Nazi-friendly vice president in the Norwegian Red Cross, but they were still seen as a neutral um, humanitarian organization uh, by anyone in all. At least that's what history tells us. So, I mean, in, in practical terms, how does, does the principle of neutrality then work? Uh, is it a bit more pragmatic than how it can maybe uh, be seen? I don't know if you have any reflections. And uh, then last, but uh, absolutely not least, uh, Mukesh, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's uh, always inspiring to listen to Hugo. And uh, uh, also, uh, he's done so well to put in words the kind of inchoate uh, feeling of uh, dissatisfaction with the humanitarian system that uh, many of us feel, basically. It doesn't work. And the most powerful argument uh, against neutrality is is your second point, which is that it just doesn't work. And when things don't work, you have to find a better way of doing that. So I've got two comments or questions, if you like. As a theologian, uh, uh, Hugo, uh, in the in the past, uh, at least, uh, it would be interesting to have some reflections on, uh, not on Chinese or communism, but also on the th more theological aspects in Islam, in Hinduism, and other aspects uh, of that, because there are certain principles there which, uh, if you say, predate the humanitarian enterprise uh, <laughs> and, uh, are actually uh, possible uh, entry points for a new humanitarianism, which uh, might find consensus, even though it will be uh, culturally based. My second point is that really, I think at the beginning, you didn't define neutrality. And I'm just struck by this because coming from a medical uh, background, we have exactly identical discussions in the medical field. So, for example, when a heavy smoker comes in uh, with a, uh, and, needs, uh, and has lung cancer and needs a, a lung operation, do you, prioritize, do you deprioritize that person compared to someone who has got lung cancer due to no fault of their own, if, if you wish, you see? 
but of course, you see, uh, in in medical uh, principles, and there is almost total synergy between humanitarian and medical principles. The whole idea is to treat a person uh, uh, not according by making moral judgments for the person, but ab about the need. So you assess the, the risk of the person. You say this person uh, needs more help than that person. My resources are limited. Therefore, I prioritize this person because their chance of survival are this, that and the other. And the whole medical business uh, grown up called DALI's disability life adjusted ages you save by doing this or that. And there's a constant tension between individual health with clinical health, if you like, save one person in Mariupol versus the public health. Uh, which in this case translates into saving as many people as possible in, in Ukraine, even if you sacrifice a few people in Mariupol type debate, if you if you get what I mean. So mm -hmm. I think a lot depends on uh, what you mean by neutrality. So, for example, I would say uh, I would say that uh, if uh, your objective is that you treat whoever is wounded in front of you, enemy or not enemy, uh, uh, according to what the problem is, then you are neutral and there's a lot to be said for that form of neutrality or is that impartiality and this is i think there's a lot of confusion there at least <laughs> in even in my mind between neutrality and uh, impartiality and finally why on earth has the uh, icrc and the red cross movement as a whole and uh, uh, including yourself and others allowed the lawyers to dominate this subject why is it there's huge discussion going on in, uh, at the moment on the new civil agreement between uh, ICRC and IFRC? And it's totally dominated by lawyers trying to uh, uh, figure out uh, which institution is going to get which uh, advantage or disadvantage in that area. Since when did, uh, did lawyers get to say on what is humanitarian? Uh, you know, uh, this is not governable by law necessarily because your area, whether it's the theology or morality or ethics, which in a sense are very difficult to codify, but in an essence, they go to the essence of humanity is one thing. Finally, uh, you know, uh, it's just pure tactics. In the end, we all look for a unifying principle. Nothing in life uh, is, is, is work. We will not create a new humanitarian uh, world or new humanitarian principles which are badly needed without having an overarching thought, a thing that fires and, uh, and inspires us. What is that principle in the new humanitarianism? In the old humanitarianism, current humanitarianism, the Red Cross humanitarianism or Swiss humanitarianism, it's the principle of humanity. So, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, and that, as you know, is an overarching principle, right? <coughs> kind of you know, towards an end. That's the way uh, Picte and others uh, have written about it. So I would love to have, in a sense, uh, that uh, <laughs> overarching principle to inspire a new generation of people operating in a much more complicated work where the current humanitarianism not just doesn't uh, work, it is actually taking us in many areas and damaging humanity. Sorry for uh, taking so long. Thanks. Thank you very much. No, great questions from everybody. Thank you. Um, so, Chris, Fron and it touches with Mukesh, okay, this point on your point about impartiality and neutrality, neutrality, are they necessarily linked as one thing? So, I mean, I think it's a really important point, and it's, it's really what Mukesh is getting at too. Can you be genuinely impartial if you're not neutral? Because can you the, the, the impartiality requirement asks you to be blind to human distinctions? You see need only. You don't see race, gender. Um, political affiliation, or in Mukesh's terms, you don't see um, causation. You don't see what got them into this mess, you know, and who's been doing what. You don't do Jeff McMahon and judge them, um, prejudge them for why it's all happened. And probably there's an argument that you can only be that impartial if you're also neutral and stepping back and having no side in the fight in front of you. So I'm going to I'm going to hope that's not entirely true. So I'm going to say it'll be often true that you won't get as well treated by your enemy as your friend. Um, but it needn't be like that. And actually, I start my first one of my first books, Killing Civilians. I started with an Armenian surgeon working on to restore the arm of a of a young um, 
as Vajani boy, as Airy boy. And he's about to say, oh, I'm just going to cut it off because actually it's, it's no good and it's too complicated to do it. And anyway, you're an Azeri and that sort of thing. And his, his Armenian mother, that is, his Azeri mother says, look, please do everything you can. And then the doctor says, OK, OK, I will treat him as if he were my son. And then he makes a different calculation and he saves the arm. So in a sense, I hope that that is it is possible you don't always have to take that neutral position to save the arm. But so I'm confused on that. I think I think you can be impartial enough. And then I would also say that sometimes justice releases you from being totally impartial. So I would I would differ with the medical view that Mukesh is putting because I, I do I do follow McMahon a bit because I do think human justice Natural justice says, no, you've done this. I'm going to treat this person first. And I think that's right. So I think sometimes justice trumps impartiality. OK, that's my mm. that's my view. Um, Self-determination internationally defined. Yeah, this is a really good point because, you know, I think that's what's going on at the moment. Yeah, we'll we'll let you be localized agencies if you fill in all our forms, do everything else that way and are in compliance with our Western systems and ideas. And I want to get beyond that. That's why I'm talking about self-determination in a different form. And that's why I'm interested in what Maria's saying, because I think her approach and then what Mukesh is beginning to say as well about saying, you know, what are other religious models of humanitarianism that might be more open than this secular Red Cross, Red Crescent, UN model, Western model. So I think um, I don't want self-determination internationally defined. But then, as you rightly say, you must have it to find somehow internationally. There must be a qualifier. So what is that qualifier? Is it only humanitarianism and impartiality, humanity and impartiality, or is it the whole human rights? In other words, can you accept the Taliban as a self-determined humanitarian organization who are providing health and um, water and food and things, but they're insisting on women being hugely degraded in their rights by wearing full veil and not coming to get their own food, having to, et cetera, and being housebound. And that's really difficult. And I would probably say, if you can't change it, you have to accept it. So I would then be pragmatic, yeah, in, in, in my qualifier. But I, you know, humanitarians have got to decide what they are. If they're fully, full spectrum human rights workers, then their qualifiers must be every right, in which case they're it's going to be very difficult if they're really profoundly going around humanity and impartiality. So women are still being treated if they're sick, but the way they're treated is probably objectionable to other issues of conscience in Western human rights thinking, Western liberalism, then it's probably still humanitarian if they're being stopping from dying, you know, etc. Um, but it's difficult. And then, Eve, Eva, your points, that we're getting into similar stuff, and the benefits of Yusin Bello. I, I agree, you know, my experience at the ICRC was simply that um, there were huge operational benefits of sealing it off, because the way you could then have a discussion could always start with, look, I'm not here to take a position on your fight. We're neutral. What we're trying to understand is the way you're fighting, and, it, and then we would seal it off, and it helped. Okay. So it is a very pragmatic bubble that you jump into. Um, and then your wider question is, is RCRC, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, the ICRC always pragmatic? And I think, yes, they, they are a very pragmatic organization, but the principles are pragmatic anyway, because principles, as you know, you know, these are, these are framed as fundamental principles, but they're not framed as absolute principles. And so my experience of, of humanitarianism as it's constructed as principle-based ethics, I write about this in my mm -hmm. other book, mm -hmm. is that it's more like a, a dial on a car. So these principles are, they're not quite only aspirational. Mm -hmm. They're somewhere between absolute and aspirational, but you drive the car with these dials of humanity, partiality, neutrality, mm -hmm. independence. And you know, if you're hitting eight on the humanity, humanity dial, and seven on the impartiality dial, you're not going to stop the car if you're at three on the neutrality dial and two on the independence dial. Do you see what I mean? So they are, it's a spectrum. 
of aspirational principles, and the two really more or less absolute ones, certainly humanity and mortality. So that, that's why they're pragmatic. Um, and then on Mukesh's point, I really agree, you know, I'm, I, I'm trying to work more as a Catholic humanitarian at the moment, so I really agree with your point that we shouldn't just be thinking about um, Chinese um, thinking. We should be engaging with, you know, the huge resurgence in Hinduism, in the BJP movement, with um, Islamism, which we've been engaging with for 20 years very hard now, Christian evangelicalism and fundamentalism in the, in the states, you know, hugely Christian religious conservatism. There's all these different values, as you say, that make up the world and in a way are much bigger than Western secular liberal values in population terms. So we have to find entry points there, as you say. I think there are lots and they precede secular humanitarian values. But the other thing I noticed that, you know, when you, the moment you start being a religious humanitarianism, you have all the other values there too. And that means, you know, in Christian terms, there are things you're prepared to give down your life for. There are things you think, you know, your life is not the most important thing. Human life is not the most important thing. And you hear this in jihadism as well. Actually, sacrifice is important. So if you challenge evil, you should expect to die, etc. So that there's, there's other baggage that comes once you adopt a full spectrum philosophical or religious position, which can sometimes compromise the core humanitarian values, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and I, Mukesh, I've covered your example of impartiality in the smoker. I mean, I, I, certainly in COVID, maybe I'm just getting old, but I came to the conclusion that actually if you hadn't been vaccinated and you'd been offered vaccination, you should be second in the queue after other people who had chronic heart disease or terminal for lung cancer, if you were blocking their queue, you had to step aside. So I, I didn't accept the impartiality rule there. I think you have a duty to do certain things, and that includes the duty to step aside if you opt out of certain medical things available to you. So again, I sometimes feel justice trumps impartiality in in medicine as well as in humanitarianism. Um, lawyers, I just agree with you so much. I mean, I had such, you know, <laughs> God, five years in the ICRC. I mean, you know, it's sort of maddening. Um, and actually, I used to challenge the lawyers because you can sit in rooms and, and nobody in the ICRC will challenge the lawyers because they'll just expect the word of God to come from the lawyers. Living in ICRC is a bit like living with this idea that there's this big you know, IHL lawyer God in the sky somewhere, and he's watching you all the time, and every now and again he will speak through his manifestation on earth with the legal department. And so I used to argue with them quite a lot, um, and I certainly refused to write like them, and I certainly refused increasingly to have my key policy speeches. They could read them and comment, but I wouldn't let them have the last word unless I was breaching the law in some way. You know, so I totally agree. I don't know how that happened, um, but it's a real shame, and it's a bit of a lack of political courage by political by the leaders of those organisations. I think to resort to lawyers to sort it out, because um, as you say, big ideas must come from other people. Really, um, I think very often. Sorry, Petri, <laughs> Eva. Um, and what is the new thought? That's a great question, and we're probably not quite there yet. You know, I'm, I certainly haven't got it. Um, you know, in a way, it might be climate justice, and it might emerge in a few years as called something else. Um, but I think you're right. I think humanity won't quite cut it once we start thinking about the whole planet. Um, but I don't know what that new thought is, but it's a really good point. It's very hard to be mobilized unless we get in. I think new thoughts uh, are living amongst us here in this room. And uh, I thank you all for, for your uh, wonderful contributions. And thanks so much for sharing your thoughts and engaging in this. Um, so um, thank you I'm all. looking- Thank you all for helping. Very much, through. much forward to follow then the new generations of humanitarian action and how they pick 
these uh, ideas up and how they think about uh, principles. So with that, thank you. Thank you.